And we believe that the Holy Spirit is touching people. And Father, your love is being revealed to people. And Father, we thank you that we won't leave here the way that we came in. We thank you for transformation. Father, we enter ourselves into agreement with so many people who prayed and came here believing for a miracle. And Father, we believe that your power is flowing in this place to set us free. So Father, we just open up our hearts right now. I know that many of you came from all different walks of life. You've got all kinds of things. You may have had problems getting here, but right now you just need to set everything aside and allow the Holy Spirit to touch you and to do what He brought you here for. It's bigger than what you think. Father, we welcome this and we believe that you are opening up people's hearts. Father, we believe that any hardened hearts, any people that have lost hope, Father, we believe that your power is flowing in here. We just agree right now and release the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to melt and to break through people's hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we agree and we receive this in the name of Jesus. Man, I just want to serve notice on the devil that it's, you, it's going to be hard for him to stay in your life during these next couple of days. Man, we believe that bondages are being broken and that the anointing of God is going to set people free. I believe that even as you come on this campus, that man, the anointing of God is going to be touching people, that people are going to be healed. If you need healing in your body, I believe we're going to see great miracles happen. I tell you, I just have an expectancy on the inside of me that, that, that people that didn't even come expecting anything are going to get something. I don't know how this is going to work. But I'm telling you, God is going to break through some hard hearts. Some of you that thought that, man, you've gone too far and you came here not expecting anything. You came here to pacify your wife or to pacify somebody else who brought you. I tell you, there, there's going to be some breakthroughs. I just want to speak hope into your heart. Lord is speaking to me that some of you came here really just thinking that, man, it's, it, we're too far gone. You didn't expect anything. You need to get your hopes up. Some of you have been hurt so many times you're afraid to get your hopes up, but you need to. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith gives substance to what's hoped for. The very first step, some of you are saying, I can't believe God. Man, things are too bad. I can't believe that something's going to happen. Well, just start hoping. Amen. Get your hopes up and then faith will kick in once you get your hopes up. But you've got to start, you've got to open up your heart. And I believe that this isn't just for a few people. I believe that this is for a lot of people here that you came here and man, you need to be stirred up and we are going to see that happen. You know, I said this last year, and I know we've got a lot of new people here, but anyway, it bears repeating that, you know, you are a winner from the moment of conception. You had a million brothers and sisters fighting for your mother's egg, and you won. Amen. You won from the moment of conception. God created you to be an overcomer. And you know, the sad thing is most people get that, that attitude beat out of them. We had a man that came up right here. He was at one of our services. He's the one that runs the Colorado Springs Christian School, and they have a branch of that here in Woodland Park. And we were here during a praise and worship service, and we were talking about believing God for big things, taking the limits off of God. And I remember Roland came up on stage to make a promotion for the Colorado Springs Christian School. But before he did it, he made this point. He says that, you know, he has from uh, preschool, I think, through uh, 12th grade or high school. And he said that when he asked the first year, uh, the first grade students, how many of you are artists? And he said, every single one of them raised their hand that they were an artist. And he said he saw some of their artwork and uh, it wasn't very good. But every one of them, believe that they were an artist. 
But by the time they got to 12th grade, he said, how many of you are artists? And I mean, it was just a few people. Now, it is true that some people are gifted and talented more, but see, that illustrates that you start off young and you just believe that, man, you can do anything. But then life comes along and we fail in things. You know, lots of, we're going to be talking about sports. We've got Tony and JB here, and I know that they're going to be using a lot of sports illustrations. And there are some people that excel at sports, but there's others that don't. And because of it, you begin to think you just aren't up to the par of other people. And then other things happen, and man, we make all kinds of mistakes. I just read a book about a woman who was raised in a dysfunctional home and was told she was a loser from the word go and things, and it just shaped her whole life. She became an alcoholic, a drug addict, and uh, cut herself and self-harm, and just terrible things happened. And the thing that turned her life around was somebody just speaking into her life and saying that you're a winner, that God intended for you to win, that this is nothing but the devil that's fighting against you. And anyway, my point is that we all start off optimistic, but things happen and it takes that hope away from people. But I'm telling you, hope is a powerful force. And I'm just feeling in my heart right now that there are people here that have let this hope go. And you may feel justified. You may think, but you don't know what's happened to me. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what's happened to you. Jesus is greater than anything that has happened to you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If God ever had a purpose for your life, God still has a purpose for your life. He doesn't change. It's without repentance. And, you know, God is at least as good as a GPS system. You make a wrong turn and that thing will say recalculating. And it doesn't matter how far off track you get. That thing has a way to get you back on track. God has a way to restore every single person's life. Some of you have been through multiple marriages. You've been through bankruptcy. You've been through failure. You've been through uh, physical things. But God has a way to get you back on track. I've got a lot of things I'm wanting to say, but I just feel like, man, God is trying to get me, uh, some of you stirred up. You came here expecting nothing. You're aiming at nothing and you're going to hit it <laughs> unless I can get you to start believing that God has a purpose for your life. Look over here in Jeremiah chapter one. Let me share with you something that God spoke directly to me. Now, of course, in the scripture here, God spoke this to Jeremiah. But I can show you the place. January of 1973, the Kingsley Place Apartments in Dallas, Texas. I was going to bed. And man, back in those days, I could hit the pillow and be asleep before, you know, I even got comfortable. I mean, I just fell asleep. But I went to bed and I could not go to sleep. And we just had a one-bedroom apartment I didn't want to keep Jamie awake, so I, I went into the uh, living room and our, our little living room that we had, and I mean, God showed up. And I don't know, but for hours, I was just on my face in front of God, and I was afraid to open my eyes because I wasn't sure what would happen. And a lot of things happened. I hadn't got time to go through all of it, but God spoke this to me. It was spoken to Jeremiah, but he spoke it to me. And, and the point is that God's no respecter of persons. If God spoke this to Jeremiah, if he spoke it to me, he, he can speak it to you. And look at this in Jeremiah chapter 1. And in verse 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Boy, there's a lot in this verse. Let me just point out a couple of things. He says, before I even formed you in the belly, before you came forth out of your mother's womb, I knew you and he already had a plan for Jeremiah. He had already ordained him. Brothers, I want to tell you that some of you think you're looking back at your life and you're looking at some of the things that have happened and the failures and the hardships and you're saying, how could God use me? God chose you and had a purpose for your life before you were ever born. What has happened to you has nothing to do with God's opinion of what He wants to do with you. You may be looking at it and thinking, well, but how could He use this? God doesn't see you the way you see yourself. 
You know, over in Psalms 139, keep your finger here. I'm not through. Man, I've got so many things I'm wanting to share. It's hard for me to get this out. Psalms 139, real quickly, let me just share this with you. In Beginning in verse 14. One thirty nine verse fourteen, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul no soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance as being unperfect, and in thy book all of my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You know that 16th verse, it's real wordy in the King James, but in the NIV. Does anybody have the NIV here? One person way back there. (laughs) A couple things. Anyway, I won't take... Have you got it up here? Oh, awesome. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Man, that is powerful. Again, most people think that God, you know, he needs somebody to do something, somebody to preach or something. And so God looks around and he sees somebody over here that can speak or he needs, he sees somebody like Dave that can play the guitar and sing. And so God looks and says, oh, I could use them. But that's not the way God is. God wrote in a book everything that he wanted you to accomplish before You were even born. It had nothing to do with your performance. It had nothing to do with your ability. And did you know, I've already quoted that verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 29, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. Whatever God planned for your life before you were ever born, it still stands with God. God doesn't change. Now, He doesn't force His plan upon you. There are some people that teach we're like a pawn and God just moves us around and we have no choice in the matter, but that is absolutely wrong. God does not force you, but he has a plan for you before you were ever born, before you were ever conceived. God had already written in a book what your life is about. You know, if you understood what I'm saying right here, this would radically, radically change our lives. Because the average person basically goes through life just kind of letting things uh, control them, going with the flow. It's kind of like being in an inner tube and floating down the stream and just wherever it takes you, that's how you go. I'm telling you, a dead fish can float downstream. That's not the way you're supposed to live your life. Some of you, some of you are doing jobs. And again, I'm not, you know, let me just apologize in, in advance that I want to edify you and I want to help you. And this is really going to help you. But sometimes you got to get terrified before you get edified. Amen. (laughs) Sometimes you got to find out what's wrong and spell it out before you can get the, you know, the uh, prescription to get you well. And it's important that you understand that most people go through life just letting, well, your parents chose this. You know, I know that when the Lord touched my life, I was going in my first year of college And I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. I had no direction whatsoever. There was nothing driving me. I was just letting life push me along. And every person in my family, my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, aunts, and all but one uncle were teachers, school teachers. And so I was going to become a school teacher just because that's what we did in our family. I was just being pushed along with the flow. And I know that there's people right here that, you know, you inherited the family business or, you know, you just did something, something happened and you're going through life. But that is not the way to discern God's will for you. You don't let circumstances do this. A lot of people, you're like a pinball machine. You take that ball and you pull back the lever and launch it and you just bounce off of this and bounce off of that. And whatever happens to you, it just gives you the direction for your life. But God, I can guarantee you, when God shows you His will for your life, you are going to have to pursue it. It does not happen automatically. You can't float downstream and run into God's will. God has a plan for you, but you have to pursue it. You have to seek it. 
And again, the vast majority of people, I, I think you guys are awesome to come out here to a man's advance, come from different countries and things. I, I commend you, but I'm saying that I would be shocked if the majority of people sitting right here knew for sure that God, uh, what God's plan for your life was. And I base this on what I've dealt with people for 50 years now. The, just the majority of people are kind of just going through life and letting life direct them. And then as I was saying, you have these negative experiences and you begin to think, how could God use this? Before you were ever born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, before you came out of the belly, you were ordained by God. God had a purpose for your life. And look at Jeremiah when the Lord spoke this to him. It says in the next verse, in verse um, 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And you know, this is the reaction that most people have. I remember the night that the Lord spoke this to me. Like I said, the Lord had been in my room for a couple of hours, and I just was flat on my face for hours. I was afraid to open my eyes, afraid I'd, what I'd see. And then the Lord spoke this to me. And when he said this, God, I can't do it. I was an introvert. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. And this was the furthest thing. You know, most people, when they're trying to find out what God wants you to do, you look at your gifts and talents and abilities and try and pick and choose and say, what could this be used for? But I don't think most of us have ever discovered our real talents and abilities. God is going to call you to do something that is different than what your natural self is. Let me say it this way, that if you, if what you're doing can be accomplished in your own strength and power, then you've missed God. God is going to call you to do something that causes you to go beyond yourself, that is bigger than you. Like with me, I couldn't look at a person, I couldn't talk to him, I was an extreme introvert, and God calls me to talk to millions of people. God is going to call you to do something that is going to draw you out of yourself and make you say, oh God, I need your help. And so most people see, evaluate, God, I've got this talent. How could I use this? You need a word from God. God gave you gifts and talents. And I think that the majority of people have never fully discovered what God has called you to do. I heard a man, I think it was Miles Monroe, say that if you want to find the place on the earth that has the most potential, go to a graveyard. Because most people took it to the grave. Most of us are playing it easy. We're just taking what is the easiest, the simple, what's the safest route? Something that is, you know, not a challenge, no failure, fear of failure. But God is going to call you to do something that is way bigger than you. Way bigger than you. You know, when we started building this campus, it was in 2009 that the Lord spoke to me. We were down in Colorado Springs and said we needed to do something with the school. And I was, I was honestly considering limiting the enrollment. I was considering breaking the three years into three separate parts and renting small places so that we wouldn't have to go to any expense. Uh, I considered just all kinds of things. And... As I prayed about it, it was the beginning of the quote-unquote great recession. Things were so bad, people were committing suicide. And during the great recession, God told me that, man, I was thinking way too small, and I started dreaming big, and we bought this place and began. We've done in the last five and a half years, six, nearly six years now, we've done over $73 million worth of building and everything debt free. And you know what, when we started it, I had nothing. And you know what, I've still got nothing. We were just talking today about things and I've, we're committed to moving into this building before the school year starts. I've already invited people for the dedication November the 3rd, but at the rate we're spending money, it'll be 2019 before we get through. So I don't have the money to do this. I've never had the money to do anything I've ever done. <laughs> I'm telling you, God is going to ask you to do something that pulls you beyond yourself. And yet most people, they just look at what they can do and they limit God. Uh, Jeremiah said, God, I can't speak. And look at what the Lord said to him. 
The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. And the Lord went on and spoke to me. Actually, the Lord kept speaking to me all the way over here to chapter 5 and verse 14. And this was another thing he spoke to me that same night. And it says, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and the people would, and it shall devour them. And so this night, God told me, don't ever say you're a child. And you know what? There's been a million times that I said, God, I'm not up to it, but I've learned to keep my mouth shut and not to say it. And I really, God touched my mouth that night. You know, prior to that time, I had taught Bible studies. I'd taught Sunday school classes because I felt like God had called me to the ministry. But I was so petrified that it was just terrible. It was like pulling teeth. I hated it, and yet I couldn't do anything else. I felt like it's what God had for me. And uh, the very first meeting I ever held, it was a three-day meeting. I went and bought a book, and I memorized three messages for this three-day meeting and I got so nervous I preached all three of them in the first five minutes of the first <laughs> service. And if you thought that first night was bad, the second and third night were worse because I didn't have time to memorize anything. It was pitiful. And it was so bad that every time I'd get up to minister, I'd, I'd ask God to forgive me and say, I'll never embarrass you or me again. I'll never do this again. But it's like Jeremiah 5, uh, 29 says, it was like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't forbear. I had to speak and I'd go try it again. But for two years I'd been trying and, and nothing would work. And after this night, God told me, don't you ever say you're a child again. You will speak. And then he touched me and put his words in my mouth. And right after this, I had agreed to a layman Sunday thing where I was supposed to get up and speak for 30 minutes. And I was regretting that I had done it. But after the Lord touched me, I got up and I spoke for two hours. They actually came up and pulled me off the <laughs> stage and made me sit down and shut up because, man, I went till 1 o'clock or 1.30 or something like that. And I mean, God set me free. So my point is, God is going to call you to do something that is based on what his plan for you is, what he wrote in your book for you long before you were ever born, long before you had ever done anything. It's not based on your talents as you see them right now. Amen. You know, I've taken these personality tests. I don't know how many of you have ever taken one of those. But I, I, I don't believe that they're totally bad because I've taken two or three of them. And I mean, it's scary how accurate they are. I had a woman give me one of those and she had never seen me, didn't know anything about me. And after she, I answered all of these questions, she started telling me things. And I thought, this woman's followed me around. This woman knows me. But the thing I disagree with them about, all it can do is take a picture of where you are at that moment. It can't tell you what your true potential is. It couldn't tell you what things would be like if you let the Lord set you free and let the Lord start working in your life. And a lot of people will see those things and they will put limits on themselves and say, well, I could never do this because that's not my personality type. Man, I totally disagree with that. I'm telling you, God gave you talents and abilities. The color of your skin, where you were born, all kinds of things that you had zero control over. God did this. He had it written out before you were ever born. And many of us have just limited God. We look at things and we look at our natural talents and abilities and, and we limit what God can do. But I am telling you that God has a purpose for your life. God's never made a piece of junk. God has never made a failure. God has never created anybody to have all of the problems that so many people have today. And a lot of it comes just because we aren't recognizing what God created you for. You have to start with finding out your purpose for existence. 
And I'm telling you, just as I said earlier, God created you a winner from the moment you were conceived. God has a plan for you to succeed. I don't care what has gone on in your life. God can plot a course from where you are to where he wants you to be. But you know what? He will not force it on you. You have to cooperate. You have to pursue the things of God. And this is where so many people miss it. They let life just beat all of this hope, all of this, um, you know, confidence that they could do something out of them. And they are just marching through life struggling. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but you answer this in your heart. If you're one of those that get up and go to work on Monday and you talk about blue Monday and you just drag yourself in, you hate your job and you just do it because, you know, getting a paycheck is better than the alternative. You do what you have to do. But then on Friday, man, TGIF and you are all excited and you can't wait to get home and stuff. You've missed God's will for your life. I really believe that. You know, Paul and I just got through with a, a vacation and I enjoyed it. I spent 10 days down in Cancun and it was nice. But you know what? I was so excited to get back. When I got into class on Tuesday and started teaching, I told the students, I said, man, I love this. I love being here. I hate being gone. I don't know why I ever go anywhere else. I just love what God has called me to do. And I enjoyed the vacation and I needed it. I'm not saying that you don't take breaks, but I'm saying you ought to be enthused. You ought to be pumped up about what you're doing. If you have to drag yourself to work, if you're having to force yourself to go through things, you have not found God's will. Or if you found it, you let the devil take you out of faith. You aren't recognizing where you are. But I'm saying it ought to be energizing to you when you're in the center of God's will. Man, you ought to be excited. And I just know in my heart that there's a lot of men right here that that is not the case with you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you that God has an awesome plan for your life, a better plan for your life than what your plans are. And yet again, many of us limit. We look at our own natural abilities and we allow life to just beat us down. You know, I was just teaching recently on this, but uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David stood up and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His own brother, Eliab, was the very first one to say, what are you doing? Who have you left these few sheep with? And, and they began to criticize him. Jesus said this exact same thing, that a prophet is not without honor except in his own house and in his own country and among his own kin. Did you know that when you start trying to say, God's got a purpose for my life, I'm going to succeed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prevail. I'm going to overcome things. The people around you and sometimes your own family will be the very ones to start criticizing you and putting you down. And there's multiple reasons for it. But you know, one of them is that if you succeed and you're from the same gene pool and you're from the same environment and if you succeed, then it makes them look bad. And so they've got to draw you down. They've got to bring you down to their level because uh, if, if God could use you, he could have used them. It's a lot easier to pull you down than it is for them to come up to your level. And so really, if you understand it that way, persecution is a compliment. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loud, loudest got hit. And the people who persecute you the most are the people who are under pressure. And so what they're going to do is try and discredit you so that they can discredit the message and get out from under the conviction. But I'm telling you, there's some of you that you know God has something more, but people around you are just constantly drawing you down and telling you to settle for less. Just take it easy. I tell you, we're playing it way too safe. You know, I spend millions of dollars. We got Doug Nees here. He's my media buyer. He could tell you. We spend, I forget, but it's over a million dollars a month on television and radio and... Um, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of things and we're reaching a lot of people, but every one of you here have people under your influence that'll never hear of me, that I'll never reach. And if I spent 10 times as much money as I've got, I'll never reach the people that you reach. And if you don't reach your potential, 
If you don't start thinking bigger, if you don't let God inspire you and show you something, then there's all kinds of people that are going to fall through the cracks. You're the one that has their miracle. You're the one that God wrote in his book that you were supposed to touch those people that you work with, the neighbors that you live next to, your family members. You're the one that it's written down that you're supposed to reach them. I can't reach them. And if you don't reach your full potential, there's going to be people that'll die and go to hell. There'll be people who'll stay sick. There'll be all kinds of things that'll happen if you don't reach your potential. Brothers, every one of you in here is important. One of the big mistakes we've made in the body of Christ is to put certain people in the clergy and they're the ones that God is going to use and all we do is just warm a pew and wait on them to do everything. You know, I don't know how many people we have here, but it's well over 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 or whatever. And you know, if every person in here was to get fired up this week and to start believing God and start walking with God and let God flow through you and give you creative ideas... And if you started living up to your full potential and doing those things that were written in God's book before you were ever born, I guarantee you, I believe that this could change the entire nation. There's lots of people that you influence. If we all went back to our sphere of influence and we're living this, it would make a radical difference. And again, some of you are thinking, oh no, I don't have that kind of influence. You would if you were walking in the supernatural power of God. You know, Jesus said, if you're believing on him, the works that he did, will you do also and even greater works than these. And this isn't talking to just preachers. It says, if you are believers, if you believe on him, I guarantee you, if every one of you went out of here and raised somebody from the dead, we'd have all the revival we could handle. But what we do is we're spending our time praying and saying, oh, God, move. Oh, God, do something. And God's praying that you'll move. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> He's praying that you will find out your potential, that you'll begin to start living up to it. And again, brothers, you could touch people that I'll never touch, that these other pastors here will never touch. It is just imperative that you begin to live up to what God called you to do. And I know some of you are thinking, man, this is just putting condemnation on me and showing me that I'm a, a loser. I haven't done what God wants me to do. That's not my intent. But I'm saying that you're never going to change as long as you are satisfied where you are. You've got to have a holy dissatisfaction. You've got to get to a place where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And brothers, you can do this. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm proof of that. Man, if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. And yet God is just blessing me and using me and people's lives are being changed. I had probably a dozen people as I walked through here tonight tell me about how that their life was totally changed and things have happened. And if God can use me, he can use anybody. Matter of fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and following, it says, you see your calling, brother, and it's not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise men after the flesh, but God hath chosen the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. And it says the reason he does it that way is so that no flesh would glory in his presence. God delights in using people that in the natural can't do it so that when God flows through them, people say, this has got to be God. It can't be that person. So if you feel like you are unqualified, if you feel like your base despise nothing, you qualify. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> the only people God can't use are the people that aren't dependent upon God. The people that think that they can do it on their own. Man, if you feel like, how could God use me? I'm a child. How could I speak? You're the very person that God wants to use. I'm telling you, God can energize you. God can do supernatural things through you. There's not a person in here. I don't care what's going on in your life, that God couldn't change you, that God couldn't energize you. But it's not going to happen with you just floating downstream. It's not going to happen with you just going through life and letting circumstances control your life. You are going to have to take control. You are going to have to start seeking God. 
And you know, the very fact that you're here means that, man, you are seeking God or either somebody who is seeking God drug you here. One of the two. But you aren't the nod to God crowd. You are here looking for something more. And you just need to do this not on, in spurts. You know, the scripture says the just shall live by faith. You don't need to visit there, vacation there. Just go to a man's advance one time a year. You need to live by faith. This needs to be the way that you are constantly seeking God. And I promise you, when you do that, it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope and a future. That verse is confirming everything I'm saying. God ha has good thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace. God never created a single person to fail. That is not what he wrote in your book. That is not written down. That is not God's plan for a single person. His thoughts are peace towards you to give you an expected end. I like the NIV when it says a hope and a future, but I, I like the King James. Because, you know, when it says you have an expected end, that means that I know what my end's going to be like because I've been seeking God, and He said He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, and so I know that I'm going to win. I can expect that. I don't have to just do the best I can and hope that it works out. Man, I have an expected end. I'm not going to go out with a whimper. I'm going to go out with a shout. Yeah. I'm going to say with the Apostle Paul, I've run the race. I've finished my course, and I know that there is a reward for me. I'm expecting that. And then right after that, in verse 12, it says, And you shall seek me. This is verse 13, I think. You shall seek me, and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. All of your heart. There are people that will seek the Lord in spurts. And if your back's up against the wall and you know that you can't pull this thing out on your own, you'll ask God to help you temporarily. But God looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 17. God looks on the heart. He knows whether you are, you know, giving it everything you've got or not. But when you seek with all of your heart, you'll find Him. I've had people tell me, well, I asked and nothing happened. Well, God is waiting on you to seek with all of your heart. Here's another way of saying it. As long as you can live without knowing God's perfect will and without you fulfilling God's perfect will, you will. But when you reach that place to where I've had it, I'm not living this way anymore. God will come through. But you have to seek with all of your heart. You know, Moses was seeking the Lord and he says, Oh God, show me your glory. And God says, I will be with you and I will go with you. And Moses, this is Exodus chapter 33, I believe. And Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. That's where we need to get to be. God, I'm not going to go through life. I'm not just going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm driving a stake right here and I'm not moving until I know what your will is. And you know, the good thing is, it says in Ephesians chapter 5 that be not ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's a command. Right after it's talking about don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It says, don't be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wouldn't have given us that command if He didn't want to reveal His will to us. God wants you to know what His purpose for your life is more than you want to know it. But it doesn't get revealed to us with, when you're passive, when you're weak. You've got to become aggressive. You've got to get to where you pursue the things of God. I can guarantee you this, brothers, that it's not God who has failed a single person in here. God is faithful. But it says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. The only reason that we aren't all experiencing God's best in our life is not because God doesn't have a plan and not because God isn't faithful. It's because we have done it our way. Us and Frank Sinatra. We did it our way. Let me ask you, how's that working? I can guarantee you, brothers, that any problem that we've got in our life, it's because you did it your way. 
And I know that there's some people saying, no, that's not true. I mean, I've got sickness in my body and I didn't have a thing to do. I didn't cause sickness. Man, I hope you'll track with me right here. Some people don't, can't connect these dots. But it's true. That you know what? You may not have thought, all right, I want to have cancer. All right, I want to have this sickness. I want to have poverty. I want to have this. You may not have asked for it. You may not have gone out and have planned on it. But you were thinking like a mere human being, thinking I'm only human and thinking that cancer is incurable and well, it's flu season. And so, it, you know, it, you just got to get sick. That's wrong. It's wrong thinking. You may not have thought ways that, it, that brought it because you asked for it, but when it came, because we live in a fallen world, you were thinking in a way that limited what God could do. You accepted the sickness. You accepted poverty. You accepted these things. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Man, that, that didn't say that carnal mindedness produces death for some people, sometimes. No, it's just, it's an equation. Carnal mindedness equals death. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. And so based on that scripture, I can say that if you are experiencing death, any form of death, this doesn't have to be ultimate death where you quit breathing and we go to be with the Lord. But you know, depression is death. Anything that came as a result of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Anything that came as a result of sin, poverty, depression, sickness, sorrow, grief, bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, anything you want to mention, if you are experiencing any form of death, it's because you were carnally minded. Again, that doesn't mean that necessarily you're a terrible person, but you're just thinking like a natural, normal person. You aren't just natural. If you are born again, you are a brand new person on the inside. You are now have the spirit of God living on the inside of you. If you don't have Jesus living in you, we're going to give you an opportunity to fix that tonight. Amen. But if you are born again and have the spirit of God on the inside of you, well, then you are a world overcomer. And you should be able to see this power manifest. It's already there, but you've got to think that way. And the problem is, man, this is frustrating to me because I would like to say five things all at the same time. Let me share this with you out of Galatians chapter five. I'm going to give you your answer to whatever your problem is real quickly. So it's going to be so simple. Some of you are going to think, oh, oh, no, that's not my problem. It's more complex than that. This is how simple it is right here in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's how simple it is. Whatever problem you've got, it's your flesh that's the problem. Now, I'm aware that not everybody here is on the same page. The Bible, when it's talking about flesh, isn't talking about skin like what we often talk about. The word flesh, the Greek word is sarx, and it's, you can go into a lot of things, but it basically is talking about your physical body and your soulish part that isn't renewed, that's not redeemed yet. Uh, when you got born again, you were given a brand new spirit. And in the spirit, you are a completely brand new person, but we have a mind that didn't instantly change. You know, when you got born again, if you were fat when you got born again, you're still going to be fat after you get born again. Your body didn't change. And you know what? Before you got born again, you had your memories and you had things that happened to you and your mind was filled with all of those things. When you get born again, your mind doesn't instantly change. You still got the same mind. You got your memories, not my memories. You don't instantly think right. That's your flesh, your soul and your body combination that has not been renewed by the Spirit of the Lord. But in the Spirit, you're a brand new person. So the answer is just this simple. In the Spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You got His attitude. You got His ability. 
You've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, 18 and 19. He's praying that your eyes would be open, that you would see the exceeding greatness of his power towards you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Brothers, you still, you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. That ought to be enough to handle whatever your problem is. The average Christian says, oh God, I know that you're all powerful. I know that you can do anything. Oh God, would you please move? You know what? You're thinking carnally. You're thinking that you're just a mere human being and that you can do nothing. And so God, would you please move? You've already started from unbelief. Because if you've been born again, you are now a new person in Christ. You have his power and authority. The Lord told you to resist the devil and he will flee from you, not from God. He placed his power in you. You are the mobile office of Jesus. You have his power and authority and you have to resist the devil. You have to release this power. Instead of saying, oh God, stretch forth your hand and heal this person. He says, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He says, you go cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. He told you to do it. And some of you are thinking, I could never do that. You're carnal. You are looking at the flesh. You are looking at yourself. The key to the Christian life, any problem that you've got, it's because you are approaching things out of your ability, out of your intellect, out of your power. But I'm telling you, brothers, it's just simple. When you get born again, you become a brand new person and you have the life of God on the inside of you. You can do anything, anything anything that God wants you to do. There is no limit when you are walking in the spirit instead of walking in your flesh, in your own mental ability, in your own physical strength. And you know, this is one of the liabilities of guys. Guys just think, you know, we're tough. We can do this. Women as a whole, I know there's a lot of women watching tonight, but as a whole, women recognize their frailty more than men. They aren't trying to be macho. Now, sad to say, well, you see role reversals and things are changing, but I'm saying as a whole, women are more receptive to realizing their need for God. And that's why women tend to turn to the Lord quicker than men because men are going to take care of it themselves. They're going to do it their way. Man, we had Jeremy Pearson's uh, minister with us in uh, January and he preached an awesome, awesome message on who cares. And it was all about, you're supposed to cast your care over on the Lord. And he was talking about who cares. And anyway, there were some great examples that he gave, but who was this that got up and man, I wish I could remember who this was. But anyway, he was preaching on all of this, and somebody just got up and said something about that they can handle it. I can handle this. It's just like when we're trying to go someplace. Women will ask directions, but guys, no, I got this. We don't want to admit that we haven't done it. You know what that is? That's the flesh. When you are trusting in yourself, it limits the power of God flowing through you. You need to get to a place where you recognize that you are awesome in your spirit, man. But your flesh is not that good. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Did you know that's what Jesus said? Most guys, and this isn't limited to guys, but I think especially guys, most guys think that your flesh is awesome. That there's things you can do, that you are confident, you aren't going to admit failure. Jesus said your flesh profits nothing. He didn't say it profits a little. He says it profits nothing. You've got to get to where you walk in the Spirit. In the Spirit, you're perfect. In the spirit, your spirit is as perfect right now as it's ever going to be in eternity. 
You aren't going to get a new spirit in eternity. You're going to get a glorified body and a renewed mind, but your spirit is as perfect right this moment as it will ever be. It says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. That's not talking about your body. Your body is going to have to be changed. That's not talking about your mind. Your mind's got to be renewed. But in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Your spirit is as perfect, as pure as Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says you have the mind of Christ. Some people will say, man, I don't. I can't even find my glasses sometimes. I, I forget all kinds of things. That's talking about this peanut-sized brain up here. But in your spirit, you have a mind. You know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Man, I'm putting out a lot. It's taken me decades to learn these things and I'm just spewing it out and expecting everybody to get it. Let me give you an example that, you know, when we were building a place down in Colorado Springs, long story, but I needed $3.2 million to finish that building. And for nine months, the banker told me, you'll have your money next week. And he told me that every week for nine months. And finally, at the end of nine months, we had a meeting with him. And he says, you know, it's been so long. Let's just start the process over. Let's get a new appraisal and start over. And all I could see was nine more months. And I said, this isn't right. And so I said, time out. I'm going to pray something's wrong. And so I went home and there's a scripture that says, when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, when you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So your spirit is the part of you that has a mind to Christ. This isn't talking about your physical mind. In your spirit, you have a supernatural ability to know the things of God. And when you pray in tongues, you're praying the hidden wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. You're praying the hidden wisdom of God. So all you got to do is pray that you interpret. So I said, I'm going to find out what's wrong. And I said, I quoted those verses and I said, Father, I'm going to pray in tongues and I, I'm asking you to give me an interpretation. And I didn't get much further than from here to the back of this auditorium before God reminded me of a prophecy that I'd gotten two years before that I had just forgotten. And it says, in all of these things that God was leading me to do, he says, you aren't going to need to take out a loan. And I remember when they said this, you know, Dennis was, was there and heard this and um, says, you won't need to take out a loan. And I was thinking, why not? And he says, because you got a bank. And I thought, what bank do I have? And then the next phrase was, your partners are the bank. You can't build enough to outdo your partners. Your partners will supply everything debt free. So I was saying, God, what's wrong? I prayed in tongues to ask for an interpretation. And immediately he brought back to my remembrance his prophecy. And I thought, God, are you telling me that you want me to get this done without a loan? $3.2 million. And at that time, that was back in 2002 or three. Um, at the rate money had been coming in and we had been saving, I sat down and, and figured it out. I'd have been like 120 years old by the time we were able to get. And I thought, God, this does not make sense. Something's going to have to change. Am I sure this is you? And yet every time I prayed about it, I just had more excitement about this. And so I made a decision. I said, you know what? If they come and offer me all the money I need tomorrow, I refuse it. I'm going to do this debt free. Sure enough, the next day they said, all right, you're approved. We got it for $4 million. They said, you need more than the 3.2. And they approved me for $4 million. And I said, you're too late. And I turned it down. And did you know in 14 months from that day, we moved into that building debt free. And then we've done all of this here, $75 million debt free on top of our normal expenses. And I'm telling you, it was because in my spirit, I already had these things. And all I had to do was quit walking in the flesh, quit dealing with things in the natural, quit trying to figure it out through just natural means. 
And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is so simple, most people miss it. But this is really how simple it is. In your spirit, you've got everything that you need. You've got all the wisdom that you need. You've got all of the anointing.